My name is John Goldsmith, and this is the fifth in a series of 10 videos that I'm making about a book, Battle in the Minefields, that I published two years ago, co-written with a, a friend and colleague from the University of Paris, Bernard Lax. Battle in the Minefields is a study of what we call the mind sciences, which are essentially linguistics, psychology, philosophy, and logic, covering the period from around 1840 up until the beginning of World War II, up until the, the late 1930s, up until 1940, essentially. And chapter five deals with the development of psychology, primarily in the United States, in the period from 1900 to 1940. And in chapter five, there are basically three areas that, that we discuss. The first is the rise of behaviorism. And here we focus on one person in particular, and that's John B. Watson. There are other people that we could have looked at who were perhaps equally important, certainly important in the, in the rise of behaviorism, beginning in the, the second decade of the 20th century. People like Edward Thorndike, for example. But we focus on John B. Watson. That's the first uh, theme that we cover in this chapter. The second is the differences that we find between the first and the second generation of behaviorist psychologists. This can actually teach us a lot about how generational change takes place and how it affects the way scientists understand their theory and understand their activities based on basically their generational affiliation. This second generation, in this second generation, we focus on three people, two of whom clearly are behavior, behaviorist psychologists. And those are Clark Hull on the one hand and um, uh, Edward Tolman on the other. There's a third person who we look at and that's Carl Lashley, who's sometimes wrongly called a behavior, behaviorist psychologist. In fact, he wasn't a behaviorist, and he said so, and he gave perfectly valid reasons for explaining why he wasn't. But in fact, of these three people, he was the only one who actually was a, a graduate student who worked with John B. Watson. That's the, the second theme that we cover in uh, chapter five in the book. And the third is the uh, uh, arrival and rise of Gestalt psychology in the United States. Gestalt psychology began in Germany and Austria and, uh, and developed. We'll talk about that. And um, Gestalt psychology, when it came to the United States in the 1920s and 1930s, was always essentially a minority platform, but it was an important minority. It had an impact on the way people thought about psychology. And in the period after World War II, in the late 1940s, beginning of the 1950s, as behaviorist psychology began to seriously lose its hold on the, the discipline of psychology in the United States, um, the presence of Gestalt psychology had an even greater importance and had an impact on the changes in the way psychologists, psychologists viewed their discipline. And it's not difficult to draw the, the direct genealogical lines between Gestalt psychology as it was uh, practice in the United States and the rise of cognitive psychology in the late 1950s and, and in the 1960s. So these are the themes that we're going to look at in this video. We don't cover, I can't cover, uh, by any means, all the material that's in this chapter in the video, um, but I'll get, do my best to give you a sense and a taste of what we cover in chapter five of Battle in the Minefields. Let's take a look at where psychology was at the beginning of the 20th century when John Watson decided to apply to the University of Chicago for graduate school. At the University of Chicago, the biggest name was John Dewey. In the end, Watson didn't study with John Dewey. He didn't find what Dewey was, was doing very interesting. Instead, he chose to work with James Angel, who was another psychologist um, at the University of Chicago in the field as a whole in American psychology, we would find a spectrum that went from the work of E.B. Titchener at one end, and that was work that was often described as structuralist, I'll come back to that term. And at the other end, we find the work of people like William James and John Dewey and, uh, and uh, 
James Angel, for example, as well, um, work that was often called functionalism. I said it would come back to this term structuralism. I want to underscore that when we talk about structuralism associated with the, the work in psychology of E.B. Titchener at the end of the 19th century, we use the term in a way that has nothing to do with the way we use the term structuralism today. The way we use it today really is linked to a terminological proposal made by Roman Jakobsen in 1929. It was used, it's been used in linguistics, extended to other areas. And as I say, it really has nothing to do with the structuralism in American psychology back at the end of the 19th century. Um, structuralism in E.B. Titchener's time was often viewed as being parallel to an anatomy in the case of in the study of biological organisms, where when you study anatomy, you study the tissues and the organs of a larger organism. And it was contrasted with the functionalist approach of people like William James and John Dewey. And th that was viewed as, viewed as similar to physiology in the biological case, where you study the functions essentially of, of organs in a larger organism. Well, let's move on. Um, Will, James, James Angel was president of the American Psychological Association in 1906, and he gave a lecture that can teach us quite a bit about how he and other people viewed functionalism at that point in, in 1906. Angel was a, an interesting uh, character. He's going to come back a number of times. Um, he had this same kind of self-effacing uh, modesty that I referred to um, in connection with William James when we talked about uh, chapter four. Um, <laughs> James, James Angel at one point, uh, towards the end of his life, he talks about the th three teachers that he had at Harvard who had an impact on him. And these were William James, the psychologist and philosopher, Josiah Royce, who was an important philosopher at Harvard, and George Herbert Palmer. And uh, Angel wrote, all three remained my warm friends as long as they lived. And two of them, James and Palmer, I am sure considerably overestimated, overestimated my abilities. Anyway, let's take a look at the presidential lecture um, that Angel gave in 1906. Angel was president of the American Psychological Association in 1906. And we can look at his, the, the lecture that he gave as president and understand uh, how he viewed functionalism um, at, at that point. And it's important for us to understand this if we want to understand what behaviorism was, because every, every movement is a, is a response to the, the way it finds the field. Um, and, and so the, the way Watson found the field essentially was, was the functionalism of his teacher, Angel. And Angel wrote, functionalism involves the, the effort to discern and portray the typical operations of consciousness under actual life conditions. That's the crucial point. As over against the attempt to analyze and describe its elementary and complex contents. And that was the, the goal of the work of E.B. Titchener. The structural psychology of sensation, for example, undertakes to determine the number and character of various unanalyzable sensory materials, such as the variety of color, tone, taste, etc. The functional psychology, which is angel, of the functional psychology of sensation would, on the other hand, find its appropriate sphere of interest in the determination of the character of the various sense activities, activities as differing in their modus operandi from one another and from other mental processes such as judging, conceiving, willing, and the like. He went on. Functionalism's fundamental intellectual prepossessions are often revealed by the classifications of mental processes adopted from time to time. Witness the Aristotelian bipartite uh, division of intellect and will and the modern tripartite division of mental activities. What are cognition, feeling, and will, but three distinct modes of mental action. To be sure, this classification has often been carried out with the assertion, or at least the implication, that these fundamental attributes of mental life were based upon the presence in the mind of corresponding and ultimately distinct mental elements. And later, um, Angel talks about the, the relevance of the work that's being done at that point on animal psychology, which means animal learning. And this is going to be important in looking at the, the change or lack of change um, between the psychology that Watson d 
discovered as he, when he became a grad student, and the psychology that he proposed as a behaviorist. Anyway, Angel is saying this in his 1906 presidential address. The rejuvenation of interest in the quasi-biological field which we designate animal psychology. Let's talk about that. This movement is surely among the most pregnant with which we meet in our own generation. Its problems are in no sense of the merely theoretical and speculative kind, although, like all scientific endeavor, it possesses an intellectual and methodological background on which such problems loom large. But the frontier upon which it's pushing forward in its explorations is a region of definite concrete fact, tangled and confused, and often most difficult of access, but nevertheless a region of fact, accessible like all other facts, to, part to persistent and intelligent interrogation. We're going to turn now to, uh, to John B. Watson and his version of behaviorism. But before we get into it, I want to say a word or two about why we're doing it. And I sometimes get the impression from students that uh, the more time I spend on a person or on a particular uh, trend, the more important that I think it is. And that's not at all the, the way I view things. Really, it's like, uh, you know, that people used to say, everybody's good for something, even if it's only for being a, a good example of what not to be. And I think to some extent that's true of uh, behaviorism. So we can look at behaviorism and we can interrogate ourselves. We can ask ourselves, what is it about this that seems to us like it's on the wrong track? And once we can give, us, give ourselves some good answers to that question, the natural thing to do is to turn around and say, well, are, are we falling into any of these same dangerous uh, holes? Are we, are we potentially not doing the same thing? I think the answer is yes. I mean, I, I read what Watson is writing and sometimes, I, of course, I just shake my head and I say, how could anybody have taken this seriously? But I think a lot of people say things today that will, in 40, 50 years, will give rise to exactly the same reaction. And if you want to know what I have in, have in mind, I, I'm thinking of people who say things like, oh, language is hardwired into the brain, or it doesn't have to be language. Anything is hardwired into the brain. And that's really not a very intelligent thing to say. And it's somehow the models and the preferences that we have and not the science that's leading us to say something like that. So that's the sense here. We want to look at what Watson is doing and saying. And if there's something that we think we, we can't understand why he's saying something that's so obviously wrong, try to figure out why it is and how it is that he missed it. And of course, ask ourselves whether we are potentially falling into the same hole we are today. And when you see him uh, doing things like saying, well, psychology is, is a branch ultimately of biology. Uh, of course, we respond to that and say, you know, well, wait a minute. There's a lot of difference between certainly the methods of psychology and those of biology, which, of course, Watson is not going to give into, but we know it's true. And I think the same has to be said to people today who say that linguistics is a part of biology, which it quite obviously is not. Let's turn now to, to John B. Watson and he, how he viewed psychology. So John B. Watson arrives at the University of Chicago at just at the, at the turn of the century. And he finds he's not very interested in what John Dewey is doing, but he's quite interested in what James Angel is doing and Jacques Loeb, a professor of physiology, and others. He gets a PhD and he spends a couple of years as a lecturer in the in, at, at the University of Chicago. And in 1908, he uh, is offered a position as a professor of psychology at Johns Hopkins University, which, as I've mentioned before, was one of the earliest research universities and PhD granting uh, universities in the United States. In his letter of recommendation for Watson, James Angel um, uh, waxes very, uh, he, he's very laudatory. Uh, in his letter, and he writes that uh, he would rather have Watson twice over any man of his generation. He's better balanced, better trained, and more effective uh, as a university man than any other fellow of his generation. And, um, and Watson is very uh, clear and explicit about his indebtedness to the older, uh, older men who uh, acted as mentors to him. 
and, and that includes Titchener, Angel and Titchener, the, the two leaders of the diametrically opposed approaches to psychology um, at this point, at the turn of the century. Shortly after he arrives at Johns Hopkins in 1908, uh, Watson wrote a letter to Titchener, and he wrote the following. I think I wrote to you once about my regard uh, for you. Angel and Donaldson have been like parents to me, and I'm sure that they will live in my memory as long as I live. My first debt is to them. It's an intellectual, social, and moral debt. After these two men, I have always placed your work and what I know of you personally. I'm not so sure that I do not owe you as much as I owe them. I think if I had to say where the stimulus for hard, persistent research came from, I should have to point to you. Well, it, it sounds very genuine. I, I believe it is very genuine. I, in some ways, it feels like it's too much information. I, I think that if I got a letter from somebody, maybe somebody I didn't know all that well, who said that I was the third most important person in their professional life, and who knows, maybe I should be ranked a little higher. I'm not quite sure how I would respond to it. But, but there's a sense there, and it gives us a sense of how Watson views himself in the firmament and the discipline a psychology at this point. Well, things change. In 1912, he gives a paper on psychology as the behaviorist views it, and he publishes the paper in 1913, and this deserves our attention. Watson begins his paper with a paragraph in which he, he summarizes what he takes his position to be. I'm going to read a little bit of it to you. I'm going to read the paragraph to you. And then it's followed by several pages in which he describes what he thinks psychology has been up to this moment, and he really doesn't like it. So let's start with the very first paragraph. He writes, Psychology, as the behaviorists views it, is a purely objective experimental branch of natural science. Its theoretical goal is the prediction and control of behavior. Let me interrupt. That's a very Kantian thing, as in Auguste Comte, this idea that science is about prediction and control. In some ways, it also kind of reaches back to Francis Bacon, who, who, who very famously said that knowledge is power. In any event, we, it's, it's a very important point for Watson and for many people in the social sciences during this period. Introspection forms no essential part of its method, methods, nor is the scientific value of its data dependent upon the readiness with which they lend themselves to interpretation in terms of consciousness. The behaviorist, in his efforts to get a unitary scheme of animal response, recognizes no dividing line between man and brute. The behavior of man, with all of its refinement and complexity, forms only a part of the behavior's total scheme of investigation. Now he turns to where psychology has been, and he doesn't like it one bit. He says, to start off with, psychology is fundamentally the study of consciousness. And we can't fault him there. We've seen uh, very influential psychologists, Wilhelm Wundt and William James, saying exactly that, that the study of psychology begins with the study of consciousness. But that does not please Watson one bit. And... Um, he says that for people who want to study uh, animal behavior and animal learning, this leaves them in a very difficult situation. And what has happened up until now is that anybody who wants to study animal behavior, and Watson is one of those people, has to somehow pretend or in any event rise to the fiction that when animals do something that looks like the sort of things that we as humans do, well, then animals must be conscious to that extent. So consciousness just becomes a label that you put on an animal, whether it's human or not human. Um, uh, consciousness is just a label that you put on a, a kind of behavior that puts it into the camp of what psychologists study. And then there's a second problem uh, from, from Watson's point of view. Psychology, as he sees it, should be viewed as a, uh, as a branch of biology. We should remember that 100 years later. Chomsky will talk about linguistics as being part of biology as well. For Watson, psychology is part of biology. And since the time of Darwin, from, uh, from Watson's point of view, it should be clear to all biologists that, the, that human beings are not a special species, that whatever principles, biological principles there are that account for the nature of human beings, 
they're the same principle that applies to other animals and we can study biology by studying um, by studying any species at all and treating humans as as special as different in some essential way is basically a rejection of of the important conclusions of Charles Darwin from Watson's point of view. So he goes on like this for a couple of pages. So after describing psychology for a little bit, Watson says, you know, well, this really does not interest me. And he writes, I used to have to study over this question. I don't really know what that means. Indeed, it always embarrassed me somewhat. I was interested in my own work and felt that it was important and yet I could not trace any close connection between it and psychology as my questioner understood psychology. And basically he says, once we understand that psychology is a part of biology, then everything has changed. And why, do, why don't psychologists understand that? Why can't they just get with the program? And he writes this, he says, the moment zoology undertook the experimental study of evolution and descent, the situation immediately changed. Basically, you know, once Darwin's ideas had uh, become dominant in the field of biology. Man ceased to be the center of reference. I doubt if any ex uh, experimental biologist today, unless actually engaged in the problem of race differentiation in man, tries to interpret his findings in terms of human evolution or ever refers to it in his thinking. He gathers his data from the study of many species of plants and animals and tries to work out the laws of inheritance in the particular type upon which he's conducting his experiments. Naturally, he follows the progress of work upon race differentiation in man and in the descent of man, but he looks upon these as, as special topics, equal in importance with his own, yet ones, which, uh, ones in which his interests will never be vitally engaged. Now, that reference to race differentiation may raise your hackles, as it does mine, and rightly so, and I'll come back later on briefly to make some comments about some appallingly racist comments that um, that come from Watson, but that's not what we're talking about right now. So why can't psychology just get with the program, is, is what Watson is asking. Why can't psychology understand that it's a part of biology, and that means that the study of, of human behavior is just part of the story, it's a small part of the story, and from a scientific point of view, we could do much better if we were to study rats and pigeons and, and other species, why this unreasonable and unscientific emphasis on human beings? I just don't get it. So he writes, I do not wish unduly to criticize psychology. Well, yes, of course, that's exactly what he does mean to do. He writes, it has failed signally, I believe, during the 50 odd years of its existence as an experimental discipline to make its place in the world as an undisputed natural science. And that's not good, obviously. Psychology, as it's generally thought of, has something esoteric in its methods. That's not good either. The time seems to have come when psychology must discard all reference to consciousness, when it need no longer delude itself into thinking that it is making mental states the object of observation. Watson wrote, This leads me to the point where I should like to make the argument constructive. I believe that we can write a psychology and never go back upon our definition, never use the term consciousness, mental states, mind, content, introspectively verifiable, imagery, and the like. It can be done in terms of stimulus and response, in terms of habit formation, habit inter integrations, and the like. Furthermore, I believe that it is really worthwhile to make this effort, to make the attempt now. The psychology which I should attempt to build up would take as its starting point first, the observable fact that organisms, man and animal alike, do adjust themselves to their environment by means of hereditary and habit equipments. This leads me to the point where I should like to make the argument constructive, not criticizing people who came before it. I believe that we can write a psychology and never go back upon our definition, never use the terms consciousness, mental states, mind, content, introspectively verifiable, imagery, and the like. It can be done in terms of stimulus and response, in terms of habit formation, habit integrations, and the like. Furthermore, I believe that it is really worthwhile to make this attempt now. The psychology which I should attempt to build up would take as a starting point first, the observable fact that organisms, man and animal alike, 
do adjust themselves to their environment by means of hereditary and habit equipments. In his most famous book, uh, Watson gave a popular and direct account of what behaviorism was. The behaviorist, he wrote, began his own formulation of the problem of psychology by sweeping aside all medieval conceptions. And this, this idea of sweeping the stable clean is a metaphor that we see over and over again. So what are these medieval conceptions? He, and he wrote, he dropped from his scientific vocabulary all subjective terms such as sensation, perception, image, desire, purpose, and even thinking and emotion as they were originally defined. Well, what's going to replace those terms? Stimuli and the responses that they occasion. He wrote, the behaviorist finds no scientific evidence of any vitalistic principle such as purpose. Purpose, from Watson's point of view, was talking about purpose was talking about, was like talking about the sun coming up in the morning or going down in the evening. We, we may feel somehow a need to talk that way, but it's just wrong. The sun isn't moving, the earth is rotating, so let's just understand science has it right. There aren't purposes, even if you want to talk about them, it doesn't make it true. So Watson wrote, we need nothing to explain behavior but ordinary laws of physics and chemistry. That was a really an important point that was very attractive to many people, this, this belief. Anybody who brings consciousness into the discussion, quote, does so because of spiritualistic and vitalistic leanings. Well, you know, it's kind of reminiscent of what Auguste Comte was talking about a couple of weeks back. Watson also described the way the behaviorist thinks or rather talks about thinking. He wrote, thinking is behavior, is motor organization, just like tennis playing or golf or any other form of muscular activity. But what kind of muscular activity? The muscular activity that he uses in talking. Thinking is merely talking, but talking with concealed musculature. Well, you know, for us today as linguists, um, just saying it, that the activity is speech is begging the question in the sense that it's, it's taking for granted a question whose answer is very, very difficult. The behavior of talking is difficult to understand. And it doesn't reduce the problem of thinking by saying, well, it's just language. Well, Watson presented some of these ideas in a public debate that he had with William McDougall, who was a psychologist. And McDougall responded to some of the things that Watson said in ways that are relevant to what I've been talking about in this series of lectures, relevant to what's in, in Battle in the Minefields. McDougall, for example, he began aptly by pointing out that one reason that Watson's views were, quote, attractive to many persons, especially to many young persons, was that, quote, these views simplify so greatly the problems that lie before the student of psychology. They abolish at one stroke many tough problems with which the greatest intellects have struggled with only partial success for more than 2,000 years. And they do this by the bold and simple expedient of inviting the student to shut his eyes to them, to turn resolutely away from them, and to forget that they exist. McDougall thus called upon Watson, so to speak, and the students that heeded this call, he called them, in effect, Noah's Ark survivors. You remember I talked about Noah's Ark, I think, a bit in chapter one, but in any event, we talk about the Noah's Ark problem. The student no longer needs to learn what had been said before. Quote, this naturally inspires in the breasts of many young people, especially those who still have examinations to pass, a feeling of profound gratitude to Dr. Watson. He appears to them as the great liberator, the man who sets free, the slave of the lamp, who emancipates vast numbers of his unfortunate fellow creatures from the task of struggling with problems from which they do not comprehend and which they cannot hope to solve. In short, Dr. Watson's views are attractive to those who are born tired, no less than to those who are born Bolshevists. Well, I don't know what McDougall thought he was doing, but he's certainly not going to attract the attention and the approval of young people who might otherwise have been interested in hearing this debate between Watson and McDougall. But it gives us a sense of what the conflicts were between Watson and other psychologists at the time. John Watson's academic career came to a screeching halt in 1920 due to basically a, 
a personal scandal took place in, in his psychology laboratory. And he spent the rest of his uh, adult career in the nascent field of, of advertising and public relations, um, persuading people uh, to buy things using the principles of uh, behavior psychology. The second generation of um, behavior psychologists pursued things in a way that was in, in many ways quite different than the way John Watson did. And this is normal. It's normal for the second generation following in the footsteps of what we, we take to be the, the leader of a, of a new perspective on things. The second generation view things, views things very differently than the first generation does. The, the first thing that the most important thing in a sense that's different is they are following in the footsteps. They're, they are responding to something that already exists as opposed to being the harbinger of a totally new way, or in any event, of a new way of, of viewing things. We'll take a look first at the work of Clark Hull. Uh, Hull was born in 1884, which makes him... Um, he, was, he was born in 1884. He got his uh, PhD in psychology from the University of Wisconsin in um, 1918, which means that he was 34 when, when he received his PhD. He kept notes, he kept a professional diary during his career, and it gives us some insight into, into what he was thinking. He was very interested in behaviorism and the way that behaviorism allowed, allowed him to think about human beings as, as machines. That's a, a metaphor that's really important, not just in psychology, um, but even in mathematical logic. When we turn to Jack Drake, we'll talk about Alan Turing and the, the Turing machine, which is out to understand how, how thought works, how, how logic works, inference. Anyway, in any event, back to uh, Clark Hall. In one of these notes to himself, he wrote, the Watsonian tradition would deny the existence of any such things, consciousness and will, and thereby dismiss the problems as non-existent. This is as vicious as to be content with a false solution. Both inhibit further investigation. That's very different, obviously, from what Watson was saying. Hull wanted to learn general laws of learning, which he thought must exist laws that would roughly take the form of, of Newton's laws of motion or of gravitation. Um, he, he wrote while he was working on his dissertation, it, it seems that the, the greatest need in the science at present is to create an experimental and a scientific knowledge of, high, of um, higher mental powers. This is again this need to create a science that we began talking about in, in chapter one in, in the context of linguistics. Hull's goal was to become, quote, the supreme authority in the fields of psychology um, that he would work on concept, concept formation, um, abstraction, perhaps reasoning. Looking back, Clark Hull noted uh, that around this time, he came to the definite conclusion that psychology is a true natural science, that its primary laws are expressible quantitatively by means of a moderate number of ordinary equations, that all of the complex behavior of single individuals will ultimately be derivable as secondary laws. From, from these laws and given these laws in addition, not only individual behavior could be explained and understood, but even the behavior of, of groups. So he hoped. In 1926, he had written in his journal something that would become a linchpin of, of cybernetics and modern cognitivism, um, but long before any of it would be a commonplace. He wrote, it struck me many times of late that the human organism is one of the most extraordinary machines, and yet a machine. And it has struck me more than once that so far as the thinking process, uh, processes go, a machine could be built which would do every essential thing that the body does except growth as far as concerns thinking etc and so he wants to go through everything that he can learn about human concept formation and learning and express express it in simple quantitative laws which can then be implemented and modeled in a machine if there was such a thing as a computer for example that's what he'd be able to use Hull was interested in Gestalt psychology, which we'll turn to after we finish discussing the second generation of um, behavioral psychologists. Hull himself looked back at these times and, 
and said that, uh, he quote, I recall the semi-fanatical ardor with which at the time some young people, including a few relatively ignorant undergraduates, would espouse the Watsonian cause with grandiose statements such as, behaviorism has made a greater contribution to science than has been, been produced by psychology in its entire previous history. I quoted that because it reminded me of, of, of this quotation from uh, Noam Chomsky that I mentioned in, uh, in chapter one about where he says that linguistics has made greater progress in the last 20 years than in the previous 2000. It's a kind of uh, a trope that we find over and over and I, 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 I find it funny. So let's try to understand better what it was that the behaviorists were trying to do. Basically, they were trying to go back to the 17th century, the century of René Descartes and Isaac Newton, and take some of the values that allowed Descartes and Newton to, to take such great steps forward in, in mathematics and, and in, in science more generally, uh, in, in physics in particular, take those values and apply them to the problems of human psychology. And the two central values that were espoused by people like Descartes and Newton were, first of all, a principle of mechanism, which meant that the primary way of understanding how the world works is by looking at how objects collide with one another and cause, cause, each, other, cause each other to change position and, um, and velocity. So that, on the one hand, is the uh, uh, mechanical philosophy. And second of all, notion of a, a mathematical um, understanding of science so that uh, the, the goal of the scientist was to come up with a simple mathematical law which would account for, for everything that we are, are interested in. And of course, both Descartes and Newton were very powerful mathematicians and they developed mathematics that could be used in order to understand the, um, the, the dynamics of, of objects in the world. And the behaviorists were trying to do essentially the same thing. They wanted to follow in the footsteps of these Cartesian and Newtonian scientists. Well, now is a good time to bring the subject of money into our story. Money has already been there a little bit because we talked about the rise of the American University. We've talked about that already. I mentioned Johns Hopkins, created in 1873, and Stanford, which was created around the same time, and then Later on, University of Chicago, I mentioned Clark University, I think, in, in passing. And other universities like Yale and Harvard were moving in the direction of uh, being more like research universities, although they had a lot of baggage in history and it was harder for them to, to get moving in that direction. But money came into the picture in more and more ways. Uh, so, of course, as I say, there were uh, rich families whose money had come from, from industry after the Civil War in the last four decades of the 19th century. And as we moved into the 20th century, it became clear to more and more of these very, very rich families that it wasn't effective for them to give money to individuals who had really good ideas that they wanted to sponsor, which they were doing at that point. But rather, what was appropriate was to set up really large foundations with their excess money so that they could, uh, they could underwrite uh, interesting ideas in academ academia and around academia. So you had families like the Ford Foundation, Henry Ford, creating automobiles, and John D. Rockefeller's family creating ultimately the Rockefeller Foundation, but there were some smaller foundations along the way that eventually got uh, blended into the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, and and Andrew Carnegie in, from, the, from, steel, uh, from the steel industry creating a Carnegie Foundation. Well, so the, the story of psychology and linguistics, how it fits together in the 20s and 30s, actually has something to do with money. So there were a couple of psychologists. I, I want to make this story not too complicated. A couple of psychologists from the University of Chicago. One is James Angel, who we've talked about quite a bit. He was Watson's thesis advisor because before Watson actually became a behaviorist. Um, there was um, Beardsley Rummel, who was a psychologist. Um, but both Rummel and Angel left the University of Chicago. Uh, um, Angel himself had become a dean and then a vice president, so he, was, he moved into the administration track. In 1921, he left and he became president of the Carnegie Foundation. A year after that, 1922, he became president of Yale University. 
At that point, he was approached by, um, by Robert Yerkes, who was a psychologist, um, who was part of the National Research Council at that point, and who suggested to, to Angel, now president of, the, um, president of Yale, why don't we set up at Yale a, an institute for psychology? Wouldn't that be a great thing? And of course, since Angel was, of course, a brand new president there and a psychologist himself, he thought this is a great idea, and, and so they did that. Well, Beardsley Rummel was another psychologist who had just left the University of Chicago, and he went to head up the Laura Spellman Rockefeller Foundation. So he was able to provide money to um, Yale University for this new Institute for Psychology. 1924, Yerkes himself gets hired as professor at Yale. 1928, the Rockefeller Foundation provides a much larger grant in order to set up a new institution which would be considerably larger than the Institute for Psychology. This new institute would be called the Institute for Human Relations, the IHR. And so here's here's where the story brings us back to Clark Hull. Um, they set this up in 1928. They went out, they hired Clark Hull from the University of Wisconsin. So he came to, um, he, he came to Yale in 1929. Um, the, the um, Institute for Human Relations, had been, one of the people who had spearheaded it was a very young dean of the law school. His name was Robert Maynard Hutchins. And for those of us at the University of Chicago, his is a big name because he was one of the creators of the modern University of Chicago. Um, he's, so first he sets up the Institute for Human Relations, 1928 at Yale. He then leaves the next year, becomes president of the University of Chicago there. And then two years later, um, the most distinguished linguist at the University of Chicago, who is Edward Sapir, gets lured by Yale University. Well, so he, so Sapir leaves Chicago um, and joins Yale University and uh, works under the umbrella organization of the Institute for Human Relations. So it's a big, complicated story, but this this is just the beginning. It continues, and so many of the many of the important academic and intellectual movements that we're going to be talking about over the decades that followed. So as we, as we scratch the surface, we find ways, especially ways that, that build themselves as interdisciplinary uh, efforts, we find ways that these efforts are being funded by, by large uh, funding organizations. I made a brief allusion a few minutes ago to, um, to, to, to Lashley and to Watson, and I use the word racism, and um, there's some letters that they shared with each other, letters that they wrote to each other when they were both retired and kind of disabused of life, I guess, and uh, they wrote to each other and said some really uh, appalling things, and uh, it's been published if you're interested in understanding more about personalities and where American academic society was. Um, it's It's worth reading, but it's as I say, it's pretty appalling. Um, the first name, the first time I encountered Lashley's name, and that may be true for some of you, was in a short book that Noam Chomsky published around 1965 or 1966 called Language and Mind. And at one point, he's talking about the way things were that when he started graduate school, which is around 1951. And he, he makes an allusion to a paper that Carl Lashley published a couple years before that, on the problem of serial, serial ordering in uh, in behavior. And he makes a comment about how the, the paper had no impact on how people thought about things at the time. I'm not at all convinced that's true. I, I don't think that's true. And um, there has arisen quite a, well, a real cottage industry about understanding this paper and what its impact was on this time, which was a um, a, a time of, of rapid change in the development of psychology, this period, um, at the end of World War II and uh, the first half of the 1950s. It was a time of, of great change. I think I'd like to mention, too, that um, Edward Tolman's last student was Henry Gleitman, and Henry was a professor of psychology at the University of Pennsylvania for many decades and a wonderful teacher. And my own interest in the history of psychology, I'm sure, was whetted by listening to the, the fabulous lectures and stories that he told about the history of psychology. Let's turn now to Gestalt psychology. I have to say, of all the schools of psychology that I've read in or read about, I find the Gestalt psychologists the most interesting. And it's certainly, uh, uh, one can make a strong case that 
there's a direct uh, genealogical line between the work of the Gestalt psychologists um, in the 20s and 30s and 40s um, and what has come to be known as uh, cognitive psychology. Well, Gestalt psychology, as, as we know it today, um, grew up, as, as I just said, in the 20s and 30s in Germany and Austria. Um, there, are a couple of, there were several centers. In Germany, the largest center was in Berlin. And in Austria, there were several. One important place was in Vienna. We'll talk about the Vienna School of, of Gestalt Psychology later, probably not today. The name most associated with that is Karl Budo. In Berlin, the best known Gestalt psychologists were the ones that I've uh, put here in this kind of light blue circle here. Max Wertheimer, who was the first Gestalt psychologist, at least under that, that name, um, and two of his students, Wolfgang Köhler and Kurt Kofke. There are two other Gestalt psychologists, both of whom came to the United States and were, and were influential in their ways as well. One was uh, Kurt Levin and the other is Fritz Heider. What's the central idea of Gestalt psychology? Max Wertheimer put it well. We almost always perceive pieces as parts. We perceive pieces as parts. What does that mean? To, a piece is something that, yes, we, we see it as a, an object, we see it as a unity, but to see a piece as a part means to see it as part of something larger. We don't just see things freestanding, we see them as organized into larger pieces of which they are then parts. And in many ways, it's this larger integration into something larger, which is the most important and the clearest example of that, which of course goes back to Ernst Mach in, in this particular discourse. As you know, we talked about this earlier. The idea of a melody. A melody is, of course, composed of notes. Without notes, there can't be a melody. But a, a note that is part of a melody, most of its value in life is in that very brief moment that it is just one part of this larger melody. We might have five or 10 or 15 notes or more in a melody. Each note gets passed over just for a brief period of time. But what it does is to contribute to this larger piece, this organization that we call the melody. And uh, Gestalt psychologists were clear on the idea that there isn't a priority to the sensation over the perception. No, the two are, are uh, equally important. And perception ultimately emerges out of perception, we can say, is a delicate, dynamical balance of forces and a balance between those forces that are contributed by the mind on the one hand and the world around us on the other. We've talked several times about the inebriating feeling of being part of a, a vanguard group. And Köhler talked about what it was like to be part of the Gestalt psychologist in the very, very early days, he wrote. We were excited by what we found and even more by the prospect of finding further revealing facts. Moreover, it was not only the stimulating newness of our enterprise which inspired us. Um, there was also a great wave of relief as though we were escaping from a prison. The prison was psychology as taught at the universities when we were still students. At the time, we, uh, we'd been shocked by the thesis that all psychological facts, not only those in perception, uh, consist of unrelated, inert atoms, and almost the only factors which combine these atoms and thus induce action are associations formed under the influence of mere contiguity. What had disturbed us was the utter senselessness of this picture and the implication that human life, apparently so colorful and so intensely dynamic, is actually a frightful bore. This was not true of our new picture, and we felt that further discoveries were bound to destroy what was left of the old picture. Well, Kurt Kofka had a recollection as well. He says, I remember the actual moment perfectly well when I learned of this new view. Um, it was in Wertheimer's room in Frankfurt when he told me, who had been his perfectly submitting subject for several months, of the result of his work and of its conclusions. I can still feel the thrill of the experience when it dawned on me what all of this really meant. Of course, at that time, I had the merest inkling of, of it. None of us saw as he had very far, but I saw that that much 
that now at least form had become a subject. Form is Gestalt in German. Form had become a subject that could be handled. It had made its final entry into the system of psychology. And that was very exciting. And they moved it in very, very interesting directions. I can't cover more than that in, in this, um, this short video. There's lots of great stuff that I'm leaving out. But we've covered the material, some of the material, and we're going to stop here. Next week, we're going to look at the two great American linguists, Edward Sapir and Leonard Bloomfield. And while it's been fascinating for me to talk about the University of Chicago and Yale University over the course of this, this 45 minutes in this video in Chapter 5, there, there is an irony here, which I've um, uh, kept from you. I'm actually sitting here about two blocks away from the Yale campus in New Haven. So you may think that I was at the University of Chicago, but I'm actually sitting here in New Haven. See you next week.